Aristotle was one of the first scholars in history to study animals and note down their behavior and habits. This included bird behavior, and he talked about bird migration as well, which is a field of study that for most of human history was deemed impossible or fantastical. Until the beginning of last century, bird migration was not well understood, and without solid proof to show where these birds disappeared off to, not everyone believed it even happened. So Aristotle talking about migration millennia ago is quite impressive. While he got some things right, he made some crucial errors as well, that sent this field of study into a dark age for over 2000 years. In a previous video I talked about what medieval people thought happened to birds when they disappear for part of the year. While most of them were nonsense, there was one theory brought by Holy Roman Emperor Frederick II that actually hit the nail on the head and gave a good explanation of bird migration. Frederick's theory however was not widely accepted and was overshadowed by the commonly held beliefs of bird hibernation and transmutation. You might want to commend Aristotle, as he was one of Frederick's sources on his migration theory. But in fact, the theories of hibernation and transformation that Frederick was up against also stemmed from Aristotle. In articles and media I have often heard the statement that Aristotle proposed three possibilities as for why birds vanished for part of the year. They either migrated to warmer lands, or they hibernated underground, or they transformed into other birds. Aristotle soon disregarded the first idea, as it was too unrealistic, and found the other two options far more likely. However, when we look at Aristotle's work, History of Animals, in which he talks about this, it becomes clear that this is a modern myth of sorts as he does not mention having any preference to one theory over another. He did propose all three of these concepts, but not in a mutually exclusive way. In reality, he believed all these to be equal and true. And it just depends from species to species on which of the three options they engage in. There are of course also endemic birds that stay in the same place all year round. Those aren't really the focus of this video, but I just wanted to mention so it's clear that not all birds migrate or disappear. We will now take a closer look at how he describes these three options. We'll start with the ones that we know to be incorrect, and see what the reasoning was behind them. Then we will see how he describes bird migration to check how accurate his understanding of it was. Starting with the section on bird transformation. A considerable number of birds change, according to season, the colour of their plumage and their note. As for instance, the owl becomes yellow instead of black, and its note gets altered, for in summer it has a musical note, and in winter a discordant chatter. The thrush also changes its colour. About the throat it is marked in winter with speckles, like a starling. In summer, distinctly spotted. However, it never alters its note. The erythacus, or redbreast, and the so-called redstart change into one another. The former is a winter bird, the latter a summer one, and the difference between them is practically limited to the coloration of their plumage. In the same way with the bifacio, or garden warbler, and the black cap these change into one another. The bifacio appears about autumn and the black cap as soon as autumn has ended. These birds also differ from one another only in colour and note. That these birds, two in name, are one in reality is proved by the fact that at the period when the change is in progress, each one has been seen with the change as yet incomplete. It is not so very strange that in these cases there is a change in note and in plumage, for even the ring dove, which is endemic, ceases to coo in winter and recommences cooing when spring comes in. This first bird that turns from black to yellow I haven't been able to identify fully, and the name referring to its yellow form was not named in the text, but the fact that they both look and sound different 
might be an indicator that they are actually not the same species. Same with the thrush, which looks somewhat like a starling according to the text. But we do have two examples we can compare, where both forms are named. And when looking at their habitats, we can conclude that they are in fact just different species, where in Greece, one migrates in and the other out of the country around the same time. I'm not exactly sure what he means by the statement that these birds have been observed with the change as yet complete. Does he mean there is a small window of overlap as to when both these birds can be seen in the same place? Or does he mean it as in a single specimen has been seen to be in the process of changing their color? As for the first, it's obvious if they are migrating that at some point there will be an overlap that both can be seen in the same region at a certain time. But if it's the other option as to they've been seen to physically change their color, then it might be explained by anecdotal evidence, which Aristotle is known to have relied on quite a bit, and anecdotal evidence is often quite unreliable. Alongside physical similarities, apart from color, Aristotle also tries to justify the difference in vocalization by comparing it to the cooing of endemic pigeons, which could be observed in Greece all year round. He notes that this bird doesn't coo in winter, and thus at other times of the year. So a periodic change in vocalization is not out of the norm for birds. But here I do need to criticize him a bit for his reasoning. Pigeons do coo less in the winter, but they do not stop completely and the sound of their coo also does not change. So I don't feel like this is a justifiable comparison. Next we will look at his hibernation theory. A great number of birds also go into hiding. They do not all migrate, as is generally supposed, to warmer countries. Others that are at a distance from such places decline the trouble of migration and simply hide themselves where they are. Swallows, for instance, have been often found in holes, quite denuded of their feathers, and the kite on its first emergence from torpidity, has been seen to fly from out some such hiding place. Some birds can induce a state of torpor, where their breathing, heart rate and body temperature drop to conserve energy, which is similar to true hibernation, but the thing is that they do this only for a few hours at a time, so by far not long enough to sit out the winter. There is however one species, the common poor will, that has developed this ability further. They can stay in this state for weeks or even months at a time, to sit out the colder temperatures. They do this by going into caves and hiding in between rocks and leaf litter. So did Aristotle actually get this right? I'm afraid not, the common poor will is the only bird known to do this, and when you look at their range, you realize that there is no way he could have known about this bird. Native Americans were familiar with this bird, however, and they called it the sleeping one. So what made Aristotle think birds hibernated? Well, he mentions swallows. Swallows and their close relatives, martens, do make their nests in mud. In the case of sand martens, they actually do nest in holes in the ground. So that could explain the sightings. However, they do still migrate, so these holes are not used for the purpose of hibernating. It is possible that an injured or sick individual, who is too weak to make the trip, stays behind and uses these nests as a shelter to sit out the winter, which might explain the origin of this myth. Now we come to migration. So let's see how much of this he got right. The habits of animals are all connected with either breeding and the rearing of young, or with the procuring a due supply of food. And these habits are modified so as to suit cold and heat and the variations of the seasons. For all animals have an instinctive perception of the changes of temperature, and just as men seek shelter in houses in winter, or as men of great possessions spend their summer in cold places, and their winter in sunny ones, so also all animals that can do so shift their habitat 
at various seasons. Some creatures can make provision against change without stirring from their ordinary haunts. Others migrate, quitting Pontus and the cold countries after the autumnal equinox to avoid the approaching winter, and after the spring equinox, migrating from warm lands to cool lands to avoid the coming heat. In some cases, they migrate from places near at hand. In others, they may be said to come from the ends of the world, as in the case of the crane. For these birds migrate from the steppes of Scythia to the marshlands south of Egypt, where the Nile has its source. And it is here, by the way, that they are said to fight with the pygmies. And the story is not fabulous, but there is in reality a race of dwarfish men, and the horses are little in proportion, and the men live in caves underground. Pelicans also migrate and fry from the strymon to the ister and breed on the banks of this river. They depart in flocks, and the birds in front wait for those in the rear. Later, he also mentions that some birds migrate more locally. Weakly birds, in winter and in frosty weather, come down to the plains for warmth and in summer migrate to the hills for coolness. So from this we can gauge that, while he had a decent understanding of how it works, he doesn't go into much detail, but acknowledges the fact that some birds can travel great distances. But of course, we couldn't get through one paragraph without him proclaiming something old. This time, however, it's not even one of his own propositions. This tale of cranes fighting pygmies was a well-known story in ancient times, and we find mentions of it as early as Homer's Iliad. Birds like cranes and storks do make these long migrations to Africa, but the whole thing about them fighting wars there with small humans is, as far as we know, not true. Since it was already established, we can't really blame this one on Aristotle. But then he insists to anyone doubting this story that this is in fact true, so we can at least criticize him for that. Regardless of Aristotle, this story had a greater influence throughout antiquity. Pliny also mentions it, and he wrote that down over seven centuries after the Iliad. The reason why it held out so long may actually lay in something that is true. But what the true origin might be between the Crane Pygmy War, I will keep for a later video, so make sure to subscribe and hit the bell icon to get notified when that comes out. For this video though, I'll stick with focusing on Aristotle, as now we will take a look at the influence he had over the coming ages. Earlier, I glossed over an important detail in this quote. Aristotle says it is a common belief that disappearing birds all migrate, which is actually correct. This means that people before his time, while not having all the details, did have a decent grasp on birds' migratory behavior. But then Aristotle comes along and he claims that it is not true for all birds. In addition, he also adds hibernation and transformation into the mix as options. Aristotle is often credited with having given the first detailed account of bird migration. But when we look at the effects his work had on further generations, we may uncover that he did more bad than good for this field of study. Before him, migration was the common explanation. By him throwing these other two options into the mix, he caused confusion, muddling the truth. Going back to this false modern myth, while Aristotle himself regarded all theories in the same light, the medieval scholars who read his work certainly did not. It was them who taught migration as the less plausible and fantastical, choosing to adopt his hibernation and transformation theories, but disregarding migration as an option. He was the origin of these false beliefs that were meant to add to the common migration theory. And it's worth noting that after his time during the classical age, migration did remain the predominant theory, while hibernation and transformation were considered the less likely. Yet, by the Middle Ages, these two fringe theories had replaced migration, and as I've covered in a previous video, when Emperor Frederick II tried to bring the migration theory back through research and observation, Aristotle's other ideas had already been firmly rooted within common knowledge, 
and it wouldn't be until the 1700s and 1800s that migration between hot and cold regions began to rise to become the common belief once again. By proposing his alternate theories, Aristotle calls the Dark Age in this field of study that lasted for over 2000 years. But hey, not all he wrote was in vain. While reading through his work, I found out that there was an important practice that the ancient Greeks performed while studying the natural world. That being, getting all sorts of animals drunk and seeing what happens. Here are some examples that Aristotle noted down. Serpents, by the by, have an insatiate appetite for wine. Consequently, at times men hunt for snakes by pouring wine into saucers and putting them into the interstices of walls, and the creatures are caught when inebriated. The Indian bird, the parrot, which is said to have a man's tongue, answers to this description, and, by the way, after drinking wine, the parrot becomes more saucy than ever. Leave your thoughts in the comments below, like and subscribe for more, and I'd like to thank my patrons for their support, especially my patrons from the Royal Tears, Othari Drake and G David.